Salami. You're PGH Fender, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> Saw you get done in 21. Ah. Clive Cooper's the name. Sydney. Call me Chook. Pleased to meet you, Chook. This is Clive Cooper with a report of the first test between England and Australia, held at Brisbane Oval on November the 30th. Australia lost the toss, and English skipper Chapman decided to bat. Australian skipper Ryder led his team onto the field, which included Bill Woodfull, surely a future captain, Bill Ponsford, Iron Munger, great bowler Clary Grimmett, Vic Richardson, wicket keeper Bert Oldfield, and Don Bradman. A young man making his test debut, who I believe holds the future of Australian cricket in his hands. November 30th, 1928, Brisbane. The first day of the first test. England batted first, led by Herbert Sutler. The English batsmen immediately set about destroying the Australian bowler. Hour after hour, the score mounted. Sutcliffe, 38, Hammond, 44, Hendron, a mighty 169, Chapman 50, Hobbs 49, Tate 26, and Lava a commendable 70. Douglas Jardine, making his debut in Test cricket, scored a creditable 35, helping take England to a remarkable first inning score of 521. Australia's morale, already shaken by England's score, plummeted as Larwood the Wrecker went about his work. Woodfull caught brilliantly by Chapman for a duck. Ponsford bowled for two, and Kipax caught for 16. The young Australian batsman Don Bradman, about whom so much has been written in this country, did not live up to the high hopes which many so-called experts held for him. LBW for 18. We once again witness the phenomenon of a young man burning bright, but ever so brief as he passes across the cricketing sky. Australia were all out for 122, giving England a massive, unbelievable lead of 399 runs. En route to Sydney, the English team left Brisbane with a resounding victory to their credit. In their second innings, the tourists went from strength to strength and Australia stared defeat in the face. If they are going to contain this English team in the second test in Sydney, the Australian selectors will have to make radical changes to their side. Radical change? Drop Bradman. It's a bloody disgrace. Bullet in the head's a radical change. <laughs> He's got more talent than all of us put together. They couldn't make the same mistake again. Hang around. Mm -hmm. Australia have lost the second test in Sydney. A little wonder. Given what must be one of the worst decisions ever made by the selectors in the history of test cricket, the decision to drop Don Bradman from the batting line destroyed their chances and lowered the morale of the whole Australian team. Another victory for England in the second test. However, the on-field tactics of the English skipper, APF Chapman, are cause for serious concern. He insists on using Harold Larwood as a stock bowler instead of for his shock value. Still, success follows success. The Australians are finding our bowlers unbeatable, our batsmen unstoppable. Well, 
Well, you'll be delighted to hear, Chuck. The selectors have decided to give this Bradman of yours a second chance. Yeah. I've called for a beer. Oh, I don't think that'll do much good, old son. You reckon? Way to the wicket. First birthday, Don Bradman has become the youngest player ever to score a century in a test match. England won this match in the 1928-29 series, but in Bradman, Australia undoubtedly has the keystone around whom the team of the next generation will be built. And so, after an absence of almost six months, the English team came home. It was a glorious morning, late in spring, and what a welcome they got. For they were the victors, defeating Australia four tests to one, retaining the ashes, and proving yet again that in cricket, as in most things, England reigns supreme. Congratulations, Douglas. You've acquitted yourself admirably. Thank you, my lord. Come and tell me all the details of these centuries of yours. I'm so glad. I need these. Uh, today would evoke a thousand memories for Plum Warner. Hello. How delightful Hello, to see you. Hello, dear. Oh, Plum. Dear lady. 
Ah, congratulations, my no. dear fellow. Splendid tour. First rate batting average. Your parents must be very proud. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Jardine. Uh, Percy George has just been telling me about young Bradman. Hello, beautiful. Oh, yes, he's quite remarkable. Really? What a grand day. That's not what Percy was saying. I think I'm about to be misquoted. Excuse me. I've spent weeks trying to persuade him, but he still can't see the truth. And what truth is that, Douglas? Well, like most batsmen, I can play one or perhaps two shots to any given ball, whereas Bradman can choose between four or five. Oh, he doesn't choose. He just plays the first shot that comes into his head. But he has no technique. Now, he can get away with this on those true, hard Australian pitches. But put him on one of our green strips, with Morris seaming the ball late. Oh, no, he's too unorthodox. Uh, take the third test in Melbourne. Oh, uh, not that again. Now, it's a very good example, Douglas. Now, on at least three occasions, the ball was short-pitched, screaming out to be hooked. He played a cover drive. Oh, it's absurd. <laughs> no, it's not absurd. At least two of those balls went for four. That's the power of Brad. He's learned that a batsman's sole objective is to score runs. And he'll play whatever shot, unorthodox or not, which best fulfills that purpose. It makes it almost impossible to set a field to him. Well, I'm sorry, old chap, but I think you're on your own. Well, the skipper agrees with Percy and says Bradman's just a flash in the pan. And Tate says that he'll have to play a straighter bat if he comes here and plays on one of our wet wickets. Exactly. They're older men steeped in the conventional methods of play. Oh, thank you very much. Bradman is something totally new. He's not interested in playing classic shots. He's never had any formal training, so he's developed his own style, a unique approach. I believe if he continues to develop, we could see scores none of us have ever dreamed of. He could rewrite the record books. <laughs> he could change the very nature of the game. No, oh, come, come, Doctor. That's being unnecessarily alarmist. No batsman in the world has ever done that. I must say, in fairness, there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who'd agree with Douglas. Out there, he's become quite a celebrity. It's not a very pleasant sight, Bradman standing in the middle of the pitch, bat raised, the crowd chanting his name. As a society, they seem to crave heroes. Well, I like Australians. It's just that they prize individualism. Oh, indeed, they continually want to elevate one man at the expense of the team. I find it quite abhorrent. Well, it's certainly not the nature of the game. The heart is the team. I'm afraid the Australians wouldn't agree with you there, my lord. Their whole approach to cricket is different. At times, I wondered if we were playing the same game I'd grown up with. To listen to the crowd, you'd think it was a, a hunt with the English as the fox. No, you were used to that. It's just good-natured barracking. Well, questioning a man's parentage is hardly good natured. <laughs> <laughs> My dear fellow, in Australia, bastard is almost a term of endearment. Well, I come from a different world, thank God. The Australians are not a people I'll ever warm to. Nothing wrong with that. Always easier to give a hiding to a man you dislike. May I interrupt? I really do feel like a cricketing widow over there. Haven't you finished talking about the game yet? Not quite. Mr. Fender and I have something to discuss. Do we, my lord? Yes. What's that? Journalism. Ah, do I detect a note of indifference bordering on aversion, my lord? Now, don't start that banter with me. I found your reporting, your criticisms of Chapman, most distasteful. Now, doesn't matter what your opinion of him is, he is the English skipper. He deserves your respect. It ill behoves you as a county captain and a man who has represented England to, to disparage his tactics publicly. It was an honest opinion. It was my job to report it. I am not talking about reporting. I am talking about loyalty. That is all I ask of a man. Not from a journalist, perhaps, but from a cricketer and a gentleman. Do you understand? Oh, I understand. But I don't agree. Oh, well, I'm not staying here to argue with you. I've made my point. But make no mistake. These things do not go unnoticed. I never believed they did. Well, then, why must you always be giving offence? Why must you be the tearaway? Why all this affectation? Not affectation, my lord. It's me nature. I suppose I could be a little more diplomatic. But I've always thought diplomacy a blood brother to hypocrisy. Honesty is one of the things I like about Percy George Fender. He may not be perfect, but at least I can live with him. Oh. 
Well, what was all that about? Oh, nothing much. My attitude, behavior, personality. That's all. Why? Douglas, there's one thing you must learn about the Lord. In defeat, they're unbearable. In victory, insufferable. Hey ho. <laughs> Shall we go? Let's. It was 1929, the Jazz Age, and our lives spun from one carefree moment to the next. Every day we stretched out our hands further, trying to gather into our arms all the glittering prizes of our youth. And yet there was a brittleness in our laughter, a fever to our lives. It was as if we knew deep within some recess of our minds that nothing which ran so fast could run for long. Around the world, there was a gathering darkness waiting to close in. The greatest depression the world had ever known, not only of an economy, but of men's spirits. Just as one generation had been destroyed by the Great War, so the next was crushed by the depression. One in five people out of work, industry swept away, whole towns devastated, hunger, rationing, and the dole. For many people, there was one thing which helped relieve the misery of their daily lives, and that thing was sport. In such a climate, the Australian test side arrived in England in April of 1930. Among the team were 11 cricketers making their first overseas tour. All of them so young, they were immediately christened in honor of their manager, Kelly's Kreish. By any measure, it would prove to be a remarkable test series, one which those who witnessed it would never forget. You see, Don Bradman was about to rewrite the record book. That's fine, thanks. Yeah, same for me, thanks. Make that three. Make it seven. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Woody, dear Lovely. chap, welcome. Yes. Gentlemen, welcome. May I introduce Mr. Oh. Percy Fender, skipper of Surrey, the finest captain never to have captained England. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much, Bill. How are you, Alan? Pleased to see you. Pleased to see you. Hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, we didn't actually meet in 28. I feel as though I know you there. I've read most of your articles. Oh, that's more than I have. <laughs> Hello. Nice to see you. Hello. I think you once described me as a schoolboy batsman. Ah, it's a journalist whim. On the other hand, Douglas here is a great admirer. Yes, we met in Brisbane. It has led to countless arguments. I think you're in for a surprise. Well, we'll see soon enough. Day after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Surrey has a very good record against Australian teams. I think we'll give you a run for your money. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> All the best, guys. <laughs> good luck, Bill. You too, Percy. <laughs> well, Don, how about the schoolboy giving him a cane? Two minds, Percy doesn't know whether he'd be for a four or a six.
<laughs> oh, God. And what a fool he made of me. He put every ball exactly where he wanted, where it would cause me the most humiliation. Uh, don't worry, Percy. We've forgotten in a month. He's going to destroy every bowler in the land. As I said, he's unique, a phenomenon. Oh, nobody said we weren't warm. Oh, well done, dear. <laughs> it's going to be a bleak summer. It will indeed. England's only hope is to think broadly, develop a new strategy, one aimed solely at curbing Bretman. <laughs> you think so? I think our only hope is prayer. At least God is an Englishman. Or has that changed too? Day after day, new records fell before Bradman's bat. The youngest batsman to score 2,000 runs in a season, the fastest century in test history, the fastest double century ever, the highest score ever made in a test. It was history in the making. And on and on it went, this 21-year-old boy from Bowden, driving the English crowds to delight, the journalists to hyperbole, and the cricketing lords to despair. Might as well throw stones at the Rock of Gibraltar. Perhaps you ought to change the rules, make a little bugger bet off a handicap. All we can do is pray for rain. Couldn't he be asked to use a smaller bet? Thanks to Bradman, English cricket was in despair. As Douglas had predicted, he had succeeded in amassing scores other people had never even dreamt of. Worse still, Bradman had led the Australians, who had arrived as underdogs, to victory. The Ashes were now on their way to Australia, where it seemed they would remain, if not forever, at least until Bradman gave up cricket. How old is he? 21? That's right. Talk about a depression. Another 20 years of Bradman. Oh, dear God. And not a bowler to trouble him, let alone stop him. Not Tate, not Peebles, not even Larwood, Douglas. Larwood? He heads the casualty list. Bradman's finished his career. Thanks a lot. There's no profit in talking about individual bowlers. It's like waging war and worrying about an infantry. Well, that's who does the fighting. Yes, but wars are won by generals. The first thing you need is a strategy. That's easy to say, old chap, but I don't think there's a strategy in cricket to contain Bradman. Not to contain him, to neutralise him. Oh, that is preposterous, Douglas. The boy's a genius. A perfect combination of, of reaction, footwork... Stroke-making? Yes, exactly. And intelligence. He's the best batsman in the world, no doubt. But the perfect sportsman hasn't been born yet. Every athlete has a weakness. Very comforting old boy, but unfortunately you can't bowl him out with platitudes. No, Plum, or anything else. We wouldn't listen when Douglas talked of him rewriting the record books. Perhaps we should, now that he's talking of a weakness. I don't claim to know what it is, but I'm sure it's there. You have to find it. That's the first step. On it can be built a strategy. Now, no cricketer, no matter how great, whose skills don't contribute to that strategy, should be in the English team. This country led the world into the industrial age. What you have to do now is to design another machine. A cricketing machine. A whole team designed to beat one man. Well, I think he's that good. I can't see it myself. Even assuming he has a chink in his armour, it would leave you too weak in other areas. The best teams have always contained a diversity of skills. Oh, what Douglas is advocating is putting all your players in one basket. I know that, Plum, but if you don't beat Bradman, you can't beat Australia. You've tried bowling him out, now you have to think him out. Now, 
troublesome times, gentlemen. Yes, another riot today in Manchester. Well, little wonder, unemployment nearly 20%. I was thinking rather more of Bradman. Oh. Oh. oh, yes, he's a problem too. Problem? <laughs> you might just as well take up tennis. Oh, come on now. You know the British never surrender even when their backs are to the wall. You were Secretary of War. Where's your fight? Oh, I've got plenty of fight. But the only way I can see to get Bradman out is to send in a couple of battalions. Uh, according to young Jardine, the infantry is useful, but wars are won by generals. What England must have is a clear strategy. Go on. That's the sort of thinking we need. Well, he says, if you can't bowl Bradman out, you must think him out. He has this idea of designing an entire team to exploit Bradman's weakness. What weakness? Oh, well, that's what it falls apart. <laughs> Jardine's rather like a physicist, talking about the atom. He's never actually seen it, but he's absolutely certain it exists. Well, now, just don't dismiss it. If your physicist had done that, the atom would never have been discovered. I'm going to see young Jardine. It's just a theory, really. I saw him in the last test at the Oval. It was a damp wicket, a fading light. Larwood got up a lot of pace. The ball was rising sharply. Bradman started to look uncomfortable. Well, what batsman wouldn't? But every time he has faced Larwood, he's hit him all over the field. Yes. Well, you were right about one thing. You always said that he had changed the whole nature of the game. Now we have to find a whole new approach. That's the challenge. Who is there can meet it? Well, England has some fine skippers. Oh, who? Chapman? Wyatt? They had their chances this summer. Inadequate. Yesterday's men playing yesterday's game. Uh, you know, you have many fine qualities yourself, Douglas, both as a man and as a cricketer, qualities that could be useful to England. As, as long as you've never been captain of a county team, it's um, rather difficult for you to be considered. Yes, I know that, my lord. Uh, has Fender ever indicated to you uh, how long he might remain as captain of Surrey? No, my lord, we've never discussed it. Would he stand down in your favour? I don't know. I'd never ask him. He's my greatest friend. Not even it meant a chance of being captain of England? No, not even then. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be. No, don't, don't be. No. I admire loyalty. So, what did Lord Almighty Harris want? He's been talking to Warner. He wanted to hear my thoughts on Bradman. What did you tell him? No, nothing new. But is that all? Well, he congratulated me on my foresight. Then he rattled on about India, his childhood. I think he's lonely. Well, I'm not surprised, given his personality. I'll wait in the car. Uh, Sharp be a minute. Good evening. Oh, good evening, my lord. I... Yes. Yes, that would be possible. No, 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 no trouble. Well, tomorrow morning at 11. Good night. I'm quite sure that you don't want to spend any longer with me than you have to, so I'll come straight to the point. If you would, my lord. Regardless of how good a cricketer you might be, I think we both realize that you will never captain England. Do we? Why is that? Because I say so, that's why. 
If I might be permitted an observation, my lord, you are no longer young. No. No. But I am sure that the Almighty would be just as distressed as me to see you as captain. I am quite confident he'll leave me here for as long as I am needed. And is that the purpose of this meeting? For you to inform me of your divine mission? I asked you here to talk about Jardine. He's a contender, very strong contender. Of course, he would first have to become a county captain. I believe Nottinghamshire is looking for someone. I was thinking of somewhere closer to home. Have you spoken to Douglas about this? Yes. He refused to raise it with you. He has shown great loyalty. Oh. And what do you say? You speak of God. But you give me the devil's alternative. Good day. Where the hell have you been? My apologies. I thought you'd forgotten. I'm sorry, Edith. We're about to go. Don't uh -huh. worry. The table was booked for eight. I'm sure they will have held it. Douglas, before we go, I'd like to have a chat, if you don't mind. And a drink. <sighs> well, I have spent the day in St. James Park. And the upshot of it is, I've decided to step down at Surrey. But why? Oh, there comes a time when a man must think about his life, his achievements, his successes, and he must be realistic. I have sadly neglected the wine business of late. And the truth is, my best cricket is behind me. That's rubbish. You've been speaking to Lord Harris. I ran into him. What did he say? He rattled on about India, his childhood. I think he's lonely. Do it, Douglas. No, I can't. Not like this. Forget about the circumstances. If I can't, then nothing would please me more than to see you have it. Take it as a gift. A gift to a dear, loyal friend. That night, Douglas became captain of Surrey. Within months, he was to achieve his game's greatest accolade. He would be named captain of England. In his campaign to regain the ashes, Douglas's weapon would be Harold Larwood, his plan, body line. The captain. The captain. The captain. <laughs> 